Thank you so much for joining us for this special Patreon-backed interview episode of The Dukes of Dice, and I am honored to be joined by Rob Davio. Rob, how are you? I am good. I'm doing all right. And 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 we're we're I'm speaking to you in Seattle this time around, though though that's not where you're typically based. No, I'm on the East Coast. I'm out in Seattle. It's one of a, a couple stops I'm making on a little little work trip, semi vacation. You just find me in Seattle today. Excellent. So. Well, it's a lovely place to be, as as uh, our good friend of the show, Suzanne, very well knows. So, Rob, for folks who don't know, and I don't think there'd be too many folks listening to this who wouldn't know, what's what's the basic what's the basic Rob Davio bio? Uh, basic bio is that I have been a professional game designer since 1998. 14 years of that was at Hasbro. Past four and a half, almost five years has been out of my own. What was pre-98? I mean, were, were you gaming a lot? Was, were, were you in the hobby a good amount? What, was, what were you doing before you really got into this industry? There, there wasn't much of a hobby in 98. I mean, Settlers of Catan had come out, but sure. when you, if you go back and look at some of those earlier games, it was still... Uh, CCGs were a lot of stuff, but I was a big role-playing gamer growing up. Uh, well, back in 98, there wasn't much of a hobby. I mean, Settlers of Catan had come out. There were some Euro games, but mostly it was CCGs. Uh, I was a big role-playing gamer growing up. And so I was mostly doing role-playing gaming in the 90s. I was an advertising copywriter. I had gotten out of college in 92, but um, I got in this sort of fell in backwards. I thought I was going to be doing uh, role-playing stuff. Because I'd done an article for Dragon Magazine and then just kind of stumbled into a job at Parker Brothers, Milton Bradley, Hasbro, that they were looking for a writer. And, um, you know, just sort of got lucky. I, I mean, I had the right skills for it. It just wasn't something that I had been gearing towards. How did that transition go from, from writing, uh, a huge part of your background, into more designing? It's fun. I really like design. I really like game design. Obviously, I've been doing it because to me, it, it you know it has so many different facets. Like you have to think physically how it looks. It's got art. It's got shape. And a lot of the games that I do have story. So I still end up doing a lot of writing. And sometimes it's creative writing. And sometimes it's the technical writing of rule books. Um, then you have to think about the underpinning of either mechanics or mechanisms, depending on what you want to say. Mm-hmm. We'll call it the the, the rules, right? So I, I I had a math brain growing up. I was very surprised I ended up in writing. So I really like figuring out the puzzle of getting the math to work. And then it's also experience design. So sometimes I think of it like a game, like a TV show or a movie or a book and how are people engaging. So I love that design has so many different facets. So I didn't so much walk away from writing in some ways. It's just made that a a piece of a larger part of my job. How did that come about? Was it it just kind of slowly but surely or was there was there a moment in what sense? Was there a moment where someone, you know, came to you and said, "Hey, hey, Rob, you've been doing a lot of work on on this front. Uh, maybe you take over a, a more of the design piece." I mean, what was it? What was it that flipped the switch? Is where more I was getting at. Yeah, the, the job at Hasbro, they were looking for a a writer designer, and actually, my title oh. there for the first eight years was writer slash designer, and they were a little unsure if there was going to be someone who sat with the the copywriters who do like rules and box bottom copy and sell copy, but would help auto design. Or someone who sat with the design team but had a strong background background in writing. And they had just done a corporate move, like one of their 8,000 they've done. So they were filling a whole bunch of positions at once. And, and it was everything was kind of a bit up in the air. And since it was so undefined, I immediately was like, why don't I sit with the design team and be in the design department? And then I'll just lend a focus and relieve the writers from some of the things they would have to do. So like day one – or even beforehand, when I was negotiating salary, I immediately moved the position over to be a designer who could write rather than a writer who could design. So like, I didn't even, I could have, you know, if I hadn't argued for that, I might've been in a different department, had a very different career. So as soon as I realized, wait a minute, these people are paying me or might pay me to be a game designer. Like I did everything in my power to make that happen day one. What were so I'm looking through your design credits and and there's a ton from from those days. Uh, Buffy the, Buffy the Vampire Slayer you're credited on. I saw a Clue DVD game designing a DVD game. I mean, what, I mean, what, what were some of the processes with those those really big big ticket items, especially the clues? I see Clue Discover the Secrets, Clue Harry Potter edition. Uh, I I really like Clue. It's funny. This is where like story comes in because Clue is a completely abstract mathematical engine. You could replace the the people, places, and the weapons with like symbols, colors, and numbers. Right. And you're just basically looking for the missing uh, 
piece of the puzzle because it's in the envelope and there's a sort of Venn diagram of knowledge that everyone starts out with a completely separate bubble. But then when two players look at a card, they overlap that they both know it's not Colonel Mustard, for example, which is not true. It's always Colonel Mustard. Uh, they know it's <laughs> not, you know, Mr. Green. And so be the, being the first person to get your Venn diagram to overlap is the person to win. So and this is what I'm talking about, like where you can wear the math brain. Um, but I love Clue because it tells a murder mystery in a mansion really poorly. But the fantasy is great because you're like, oh, at the end, you're like, hey, I guess I was the murderer. And the fact is you find the body and you can't tell if they've been shot or strangled or bludgeoned. Like, who knows? Right. Like it just breaks down as a story. So I always love the opportunity to do a Clue game because to me, I felt like the story could be coaxed out so much more than it was that you could add suspense and you can add more mystery and you could add logic and you could add deduction. Uh, so Clue DVD was a lot of fun to design because DVDs are so crappy as a way to um, integrate into board games. So you had a TV screen and you had the, the game board and somehow you had to convince the players that they were talking to each other or they were at least aware of each other, which is completely untrue. So you needed this DVD doing something and the game doing something. And then there's just this wonderful illusion of how to get them to go together. Um, but what the DVD did is it, it just added a whole bunch of stuff there. The mysteries in there are actually, there's a free play mode, but they're pre-scripted. There's like 12 pre-scripted mysteries. Um, you can see some of the work I was doing that turned into legacy work later. It's, it's, it's consumable in a way. I'm like, I can tell, I can do a much better mystery if I give you very, very specific clues and you have to use deductive reasoning to do it. But once you've played it and you've heard it all, you can't play it again. And I got a lot of blowback from that on, on various DVD games. I took that approach and it was sort of in retrospect, trying to create a better experience by making it not infinitely repeatable. And, and, you know, for the first time, usually in Clue, if you make a guess, you open up the envelope and you can see the correct answer. So therefore you either win or you're out of the game and Clue DVD, since it knew the answer, you could make a guess and then it would tell you like you got two out of four correct. Mm. Um, and no one else actually even knows what you guessed. All you know is, okay, I'm off on two. I feel pretty sure about the suspect. And there were four because the last one was time. So it was like mustard at the tennis court, um, you know, stole, I think you stole something, stole a necklace around tea time. And that's tea, like what you drink, not what right. you golf. No, I yeah, figured and, as much. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's British. Makes and, sense for uh, Clue, right? That fits the theme. Yeah. And so there was just a, like a bunch of wonderful things to do. And, it, you know, uh, you know, it, and then every DVD player, technically this is, you know, a decade ago or even longer had some underlying specs that they were supposed to ascribe to. So you could do these codings about like random searches. If you remember DVDs, they, were, they had all these buttons that you never used, um, but you could leverage them to turn them into a game. But everyone had one, one of their DVD players to be dirt cheap. So most of them didn't act, weren't actually up to spec because no one used those functions. They just put it in and played a movie. And so why put all this underlying code in? So then we had to pay external agencies to try to run the game on like the top 60 DVD brands to see if it, how many succeeded and how many failed. So it was just, it was a really interesting diversion and side thing of how to take this clue game and add more story and add a technology that didn't exist and give the illusion and deal with prefabricated cases and what the audience reaction would be to something that you can't repeat. So it's interesting that you picked that one because I think I did a lot of interesting, fun work in that. And most people never played it and never heard of it, but they were, it was fun to make. What was the reception back in the day to that? Um, it's funny. It did all right. Um, you know, you remember Hasbro is by and large making games for people who wouldn't listen to this podcast. Right. right? It's a lot of families, a lot of kids. Um, there weren't even podcasts when I was making it. And, and I think it did all right. I think it made it. Most Hasbro games are meant to last a year and they hope it lasts two and that'll pay for it and make a profit. Um, they always hope where they're going to have another evergreen game, but they really haven't had one since Taboo oh, wow. in the 80s. Right. I don't think they put in my career there. They didn't create an evergreen. Um, and so that's just the assumption now that it's sort of a fashion industry and you and you just keep turning over and doing new things. So I think it made it two years. And did fine, but Hasbro does such big numbers. I mean, they probably their first print run was a quarter million. Oh man! So, so it, it, when people talk about now like uh, games I've made, like Pandemic Legacy, and you know, the, like the success and stuff, I'm like, they probably still hasn't sold any more than 
a Star Wars licensing game that I did, like just because you the numbers are off by a factor of ten for print runs. So it's it's an interesting uh, place going from that world to the hobby market world, and the difference in sort of there's a lot more respect and a lot more discussion about the games I make now, but a lot lower sales. Right, right, and and yeah, and I'm going to get to that. I, I think that's an interesting. An interesting thought, that transition that you had to make from from one side of the industry, in a sense, to the other. The the side of the industry that that a lot of folks who listen to this podcast, I don't know if poo poo, but but almost ignore to some degree. The, well, no, they they poo poo it. Which well, is fine, okay, I, some people do. I, I try yeah, not to. I try. Yeah, well, I, I don't know if you've yeah. ever played. Have you played Heartthrob, Rob? I, I have not. Oh, you need a, if you can hunt down a, a copy of Heartthrob. Uh, uh, g- give it a shot. It's a it's it's a terrible terrible game, but so bad it's good kind of a game. Okay. Anyway, I, uh, so I'm, I'm just laughing because there's a lot of games like that out there. Um, I actually think in the past mm, th- this decade, uh, the, the the big game companies for the most part have really sort of pivoted to simple, simple, simple games. Mm. Like a lot of games that I would get to work on or get to um, push or otherwise be involved with from the late '90s and last decade would never get made now, just because people are like, no, no. Kids want a game that's 18 seconds long and, and you know, you, they don't want to think, you know, it wants to read a rule and put two rules in it. And like all these like sort of weird parameters to try to make the game super simple rather than super interesting. And um, I don't think it's really worked out that well for them. I don't I mean, but then again, I take it back. Pie Face, which Hasbro did probably sold literally four million copies. <laughs> Loop and Chewy was uh, was pretty successful, too. Yeah, but, but both of these really um, are the type of thing where they're not really games. They're like toys with a victory condition. And so that's where they've been spending a lot of their time. And those aren't necessarily bad. It's just hard to have 50 good ones in a line, right? You can have Pie Face and then I actually couldn't tell you another thing they did that year. But Pie Face probably made up for all the ones that didn't quite work out. So during those Hasbro days, you, you did a lot of work in IPs, um, uh, Star Wars especially. What was what was that kind of work like? I'd have to imagine, at least for many of these, you had to have been decent fans of some of these. Um, was it was it nice working in those worlds? It was a blast. Uh, most of them. Um, I've discovered that you really have to understand and be a fan of a license to do a very good game. You can do a good game if you have to learn the license, but it's almost like a second language, like the tone. It's like you're, you're not part of the culture. So you get the tone wrong. Um, uh, but I, I mean, I still literally have the star Wars bed sheets that I got when I was nine, uh, seven in 1977 and my son sleeps on them, like the actual ones from 40 years ago. Oh man. So star Wars really kicked off my nerddom, like a lot of other people born around the same time. Uh, so I loved working on anything star Wars. And I did a Star Wars Game of Life, uh, Jedi's Path. It was called Game Get like like read the expanded universe books and came up with missions based on different books. Like I made this fevered game that probably about three people got all the stuff I put in there. So I, I could go over the top. Um, I, I liked Harry Potter, not as much as Star Wars because I was an adult when it came out. Um, Marvel, I think I did very little with Marvel. Marvel. But I was a big comic book guy. So almost all the licenses that Hasbro had, uh, I was a super big fan of. And it was always a treat to do it. And I don't consider a license to be um, a handicap at all. It's almost like a, a just a guideline of you know who the good guys are and the bad guys and how it's supposed to feel. And if you're coming up with like, oh, I need a deck of weapons. And, you know, it's some game. Or, oh, here are 15 from the source material and what they do. Um, so in some ways, it, once you get the core fantasy and feel right, I feel like a good license helps you almost write itself. Now, if you don't know the license, that's when you're in trouble. Like, okay, there's 15 weapons, then I need to figure out the cool five and here are 30 characters and what six should be in here. And you don't really know it. That's where I said you end up a little, a little tone deaf and, and it shows in the final product. Is there, is there sort of an undiscovered gem or an underappreciated gem that you think, that you think gamers on the hobby side would appreciate that, that was put out under Hasbro uh, that, that did, just didn't get the play or would have gotten ignored or, or wouldn't even be on, on a typical gamer's radar that you think they should pay attention to because it's actually better than it might appear? Uh, yeah, there are a number of games. I worked um, across the aisle not in a political sense, literally across <laughs> Bi- the bipartisan aisle. game design. Yeah, yeah uh, with Craig Van Ness. And uh, he did like a roller coaster tycoon game about 15 years ago that was really good we did epic duels most people know about that we did epic duels together i did a game of life card game okay uh 
which I really liked in like 2002. Um, did it have a card spinner, like a card based spinner? It did not have a card spinner. Ah. It was, it was, it, this is another thing, which is the game of life. It's funny. Monopoly gets all the crap in our, in you know, the hobby industry, but the game of life is infinitely worse, right? Monopoly is a game that's 80 years old and actually has like trading and auctioning and le- leveraging cash. And it's very dated and it's got its flaws, but it's a perfectly mediocre game that gets too much attention. The game of life is just flat out awful. There's, like three decisions in the game and all you do is it's bookkeeping and no decisions, but it exists because the core fantasy of what happens when I'm an adult and what's my life's journey is really compelling. So I just took that core fantasy and did a card game that was almost entirely just brand new mechanics wrapped around it. Um, so you had an early life and late life. You can decide whether you're going to put career first or family first. And, you know, by a large, you know, it worked. It was still, I had like 80, no, not even 80, like 50 cards that I had to tell a story with. Um, but I was pretty happy with how that came out. The DVD games, two of them that I did, I really liked the clue one we talked about earlier. And then there was a monopoly one called tropical tycoon. Not that people have functioning DVD players anymore, but right. both of those are pretty good. If you have like people like I'll never play a monopoly game. And I'm like, okay, I, I know you were saying that I, I tried to make this game a playable one. Like if you have people who aren't gamers who absolutely want to play a game they feel comfortable with, and you're like, Oh, I'm not going to play base monopoly. Like this is a, a good substitute. I think Flip the Table talked about uh, Tropical Tycoon not too long ago, if I'm not mistaken. They, they may have. There's a couple of people who who still like that or who are aware of it. Um, that's all I can think. Of. I mean, I did a lot of Trivial Pursuit games, and then there were like other Star Wars licensed games that just you know were fine. Sometimes you put out so many things there that you know it's it was a great way to learn how to do gaming, but sometimes it just didn't come out great because you know marketing restrictions, licensor restrictions, you're doing too many things at once. The pricing didn't work out. Um, there's a lot of reasons why a game can, the, in the final version doesn't necessarily, you know, match your intentions. You start out and you're like, I want to make the best game ever. Although I have to admit when I get monopoly Lord of the Rings assigned to me, they're like near when the movies were really peaking. And I just laughed. Cause I said, I don't know what's worse that I have to do this or I didn't see it coming. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, and I and I mean honestly, I spent the initial design time was like two hours. I'm like, uh, what are you going for? What's the currency of this world? I'm like power. Okay, great power. <laughs> what are the spaces great. <laughs> what are the things that you move? All right, and then I'm like, and what's something that can make this game over in a reasonable way? And I put you get like a copy of the One Ring. It's actually metal and like was really cool. Hasbro had a whole bunch of them, and you, it starts on Go, and then I th- I think I replaced one of the pips with the Eye of Sauron. Nice. Okay. And in like one of the ones, I went through a little phase where I was replacing things on dice faces. Every time you rolled that, you moved the ring around the board. And when it got to Mount Doom at the end, the game was over and whoever had the most power won. So it was not a like, I'm like, this game is going to end no matter. It moved only on the property. So after 28 of those rolls, it went around. Of course, it's, you know, all up in there. If you roll a ton of them at the beginning, it's a super short game and you may not roll them. It's a long game, but at least it was something that tried to drive it to a conclusion. Right, as opposed to Monopoly, typical base Monopoly, which can last forever. Mostly because people play it wrong. Right, with, uh, the, with the free the money on free parking? Free parking, that's the number one way to make it. And then people don't put properties up for auction if someone declines to buy them. People don't understand the housing shortage rules. There's, it, it's, it's very easy for it to go wrong, but if you play it perfectly by the rules, it's just a wonderfully average, out-of-date game. Like It's not spectacular in any particular way, but it's not endless and horrible. Interesting. Another one that you did a lot of work on there, and and we're kind of moving slowly towards the legacy one. I can hear I can hear some of the hobby folks like ask him about legacy games. Ask him about legacy <laughs> games. Uh, is Risk? You did a lot of work in Risk, and, oh, yeah. and was that another one that you you mentioned you really liked Clue and sort of the the world that Clue was in? Uh, was that something where you were attracted to Risk too, or was that one that that kind of got thrown on your desk and you grew to love it? Uh, what was that process like? Well, I wasn't a big Risk player before joining Hasbro. I mean, I had played it and it was fine. And now that I'm out of Hasbro, I don't necessarily play a ton of risk. But when I was there, it was wonderful for two reasons. It was the game that was the closest to a hobby game that had some teeth to it. And it was a game that like, if you're going to do a monopoly game, like putting one rule in, like if you roll doubles or moving the ring was about as far as you could push it because it's the like the sacred cow. Um, but risk the no one in, in management or marketing cared at all. Like if like we're going to redo this and keep the core engine and do it different. And they're like, yeah, whatever, whatever. Right. This is for people who want a deeper game experience. So I could take 
the basic idea of risk and say, okay, you, you know, attacker rolls three dice, defender rolls two dice, you territory control is good. There's a card draw system and really kind of go anywhere with that. So I had the most creative freedom to do something that for Hasbro had some weight and I could go further afield than most of the restrictions on other brands. So I really enjoyed working on risk as a result. Um, and it marries well with Star Wars and it marries well with Lord of the Rings and a lot of, you know, movies or, or licenses involve, um, you know, war and battle. So I had a lot of fun doing, doing risk games. And, um, at some point I looked and obviously I didn't do the original one. I wasn't even born. Um, but I realized that there were like 13 different risk games out and I had worked on 10 of them or something like that. I mean, and so there was this weird thing to realize without meaning to, or necessarily trying that it had been a brand that I had influenced quite a bit. Um, and that was like kind of a cool feeling. That's where I'd been working in games like for maybe 10 years and I was, Oh, I've, I've kind of done something right. I've kind of, you know, made a body of work. And so risk has a, a special place in my heart as a result. I just, you know, I don't, I worked on it so long and so much. I don't necessarily pull it out and, and play a game of it now. So how does risk legacy come about? Well, we have a limited amount of time, so I have to give you a limited answer, but basically <laughs> the idea and I've talked about this a lot, and I think a lot of people have heard it, so I'll, I'll try to give a different spin or at least a shorter spin. But the idea was during a brainstorm talking about Clue, I kind of came up with the idea about game permanence, right? I'm, again, I'm a big role player. It's not much different than role playing. You start the next week, you're like, where were we? Oh, yeah, okay. And you, you, know, and you get items and characters die. And so it was taking some of the role playing stuff of my youth and applying it to a board game. And it was originally going to be for clue and called the usual suspects where you had like a, like the DVD. I'm like, we'll do another game with 12 chapters to it, but it's a much more that one chapter carries on. They're all part of a larger story. And I pitched my heart out to Hasbro and they thought I was crazy. Um, as one of like, here's eight different things we can do for clue next year, you know, which one. So it lay, it lay uh, dormant. And then this was a time when target, the store was starting to put a lot of hobby. They, they had like a new hobby game section and Hasbro's really good at defending its turf. So when they see some of their shelf space go away, they go, Oh, hold on. We got to do some of these games if that's what they're interested in. And I said, well, what if we take that idea I had for this usual suspects, but risk, which is more of a hobby game and kind of put them together. And that's really how I got the green light to do it. And it almost died a lot. And there's this whole long story of how it got to market. But, you know, once I kind of got into it, I just said, I'm just I knew I was probably leaving soon because the company was likely to move, which it did. And I knew I couldn't follow it, which I couldn't. So I'm like, this might be my last hurrah to do something just ridiculous before I have to go get a real job. And and so I, there was like it was completely off the radar. There were a lot of people, like I said, Craig Van Ness and other people, you know, in the department kind of like rooting for it. And how about this idea? And how about, no, you really need to do that thing under the tray. And no, you really need to do this. And sort of uh, either gave advice or at least encouragement to kind of continue down this crazy path. Um, and then it came out right about when I was leaving. So it, it could not have been a better calling card for an independent designer looking for work. Man, oh man, no kidding. And during that process, because it was something so wholly unique, or, or at least feels unique to us as gamers, uh, you know, was were there doubts as to whether this could work or, or would be something that would be well-received? Oh, yeah. I mean, I no one is more surprised than I am that everyone's reaction isn't the, this is ridiculous, this is consumable, I'm not writing on it, I'm not doing it, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. What was he thinking? Right. That, that was what I expected 95% of the people to respond and 5% go, yeah, this, you know, this is kind of cool. It's different. Right? It was going to be like an art project designer to designer. Um, but I was working on it going, oh, I think this is going to resonate. And I would send it to play testers and say, I just want to send you a new risk, risk game. And I'm like, I'm not going to tell you anything about it. Just tell me when you got the box and open up, make sure all the pieces are in there. And then they would sometimes email, but often they would call and be like, what the hell is this? This is amazing. <laughs> Like, what? Is this really what I think? I'm like, I don't play it. See if it works. So I kind of knew early on, both from internal playtesting and external, that it might be a little bigger or more widely received than I thought. But no, I really had no idea. And I'm still surprised to this day that I'm known for that. Because usually I think people are going to be more like, hey, yeah, you see that guy over there? He's the one who did that weird thing with the stickers. Right? I thought that was going to be the, the takeaway. 
and yet it it turned into something that that really has has steered you of late in that in that pandemic legacy comes a few years down the line and and that fantastic collaboration between yourself and and Matt Leacock that yeah. is not only incredibly well received is still as of the time of this recording the number one board game on BGG oh by, by the time it comes out it'll be Gloomhaven so <laughs> maybe <laughs> it's it's picking up it's picking up ground you never know and and Scythe was chipping away at a while kind of working its way up up the up the charts why do you think that one got the kind of reception it got i i have no idea i am so thankful for everyone who enjoyed it i mean i have to say when uh, matt and i were working on it together it every game has like to me feels like driving a, a truck in sand in the sense like when you're designing like you're just spinning your tires and you know you don't feel like you're going forward and you just look back and go oh i guess i've made progress Right. But it doesn't feel like it. But something about this game from the very beginning, I was like, we, you know, we figured out our our, our beats and we started playtesting and, and it just kind of worked. Now, we had the usual game design of like wrong ideas and, you know, thinking things through. But something about our partnership in this particular game felt like right from the beginning. Oh, this is this is moving faster than I thought. This is we're making more progress than I thought. Oh, that's a clever idea that actually worked. Uh, whether it's just the right combination of two people at that time or just luck or, you know, me desperately going, I want to make a living as a solo designer and, you know, just pouring my heart into it in a way I had never before. I don't know what it was, uh, but it, it just kind of came together. I mean, season two comes out uh, in a couple months towards the end of the summer, early fall. I actually, every time I think about this, I have to remember to email them and ask what the exact date is. Um <laughs> And, you know, I'm, I'm super nervous about that. Cause the question is, did we end up doing a Godfather two or, or empire strikes back or aliens two, or did we just make matrix reloaded? Right. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. 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 Right? And, it, um, and it's interesting to think about it in that, in that type of IP sense, because for board games, there's, there's typically no monopoly two. you know, there's typically no settlers of Catan two. There might be expansions or, um, rethemings or a ticket to ride Europe or kind of a twist, but they're they're not they're they're thought of in that same universe, but not necessarily as a as a sequel, as a, as an as another season, so to speak. Which I, I love that that theming of season one and season two. Uh, yeah, and I mean, and in some ways, that the, now that you say it that way, the um, the one and two is is a bit misleading in a sense because you don't need to have played one to play two. Obviously, there's going to be m- much more that you understand because. They're set in the same world. It's just season two, and I'm not spoiling anything. That yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm being very careful there. too. Yeah, no, no, this is on the bo- box bottom, which you can find on Board Game Geek, um, which is it's, it picks up 71 years after season one. Um, and so, if you're like don't know what happened in season one, you'll be like, I don't, you know, I can figure out what's going on. But again, it's like coming in on a second movie, but nothing that you did in your first game carries over. Matt and I talked about it. We couldn't figure out a way to have all the various end states of the first one be a, a way to start the second one and have all of them work without just the design space getting so wide that nothing we couldn't, you know, nothing get done. So. It's not like a mass effect Two where some of those could in theory carry over. And I guess that's maybe a disadvantage, a uh, potential disadvantage of, of board games versus video games in some ways is yeah, I can imagine that would be impossible to do. Well, we would have had to take everyone's disparate, um, experiences and then quickly funnel them down to get them to the same thing just because we couldn't have a game that was $400 with, you know, 500 cards. And if you did this, then do this. And you, and you would, you know, be throwing away half your game because you're on a different timeline. So since we couldn't keep it wide and we we're already going to be funneling people down to sort of not the same experience, but working in a smaller you know, smaller parameters, a smaller sandbox, we just kind of decided to move it 71 years out so that you already kind of start like the timelines have converged over those generations, no matter what you did, um, they kind of come together in a way that you'll figure out. Now I'm not going to spoil it. Yeah, and, and again, not trying to spoil anything, but for for folks who are a fan of of season one, are there going to be new new? I'm sure I'm sure there are new twists to this. What yes. what are some of the new things? Or and I'm trying to talk about this as this is the most impossible thing to talk about. Uh, yeah, I'm used yeah. to it. I'll help you through it. Yeah. Okay. What are what are the hooks? I guess if you really loved season one, other than more of season one and season two, my guess is there's going to be knowing how season one played out. And full disclosure, we got to I think September October, 
and yeah. haven't been able to get the group of four of us back together to finish off the thing, which has frustrated me to no end at this point. I'm in sorry, any case, I told, yeah, I, t- I told you I took all the things from role playing and put in here, and one is getting the campaign to have legs. Yeah, right? yeah. Like, well, we can't do it again. But at least with D and D, you can suddenly have that weird, like suddenly the wizards quasi invisible for a week, right? Because <laughs> they're not there, and so you don't cast right. spells, but they're still they show up the next week. Like, oh, I didn't notice you over there. Um, which you can't really quite do here. Yeah, no, that's fine. So um, what we didn't want to do is just do Pandemic Season 1 again. Uh, like, And so Pandemic Season 1 starts with basically Pandemic because we figured everyone's played Pandemic and then goes in a, in a, you know, a different direction. And we said, eh, we're not going to start with uh, Base Pandemic. We're going to start with a new, very close sibling of Pandemic um, for season two, because if you played season one, you've played roughly 15 or 18 versions of base pandemic with twists. And I'm like, I'm not sure people were up for another 15 to 18 versions of base pandemic, um, with twists. And that's like, yeah. And so we started with a, first we created a, a almost like a new standalone pandemic esque game. And then we, once we felt like we had that done, that became our January. And then we designed a new, um, campaign from there. So I got some some questions from folks on the Board Game Geek Guild that I wanted to get into. Of, of course, some of them dealing in, in this whole concept of, of legacy games. And, and so Chris K was curious, is there an IP or game that you want to give the legacy treatment to? No, I have parameters of what I think is an, is an interesting game to do it, which is a game that um, has a fairly simple core engine. So you have room to do expansions, add, add new rules and new mechanisms to it without it becoming very bloated, right? If you started with something that was like Mage Knight, right? Or something that was like Twilight Imperium or, or you know, it, it's just, it's already big. Um, and, and then the second thing is it's something that feels like the beginning of a story. So there are a lot of Euro games, which are deliberately have a theme that's um, added on to an underlying sort of basic math puzzle. And a lot of those don't really make you feel like you're telling a story, like take a lot of, and I, it's not a dig, Reiner Knizia's game. Like I can't take Ra and start a story around it. It's just going to be um, like, it's just not going to tell an interest. It's either going to be, it's going to be such a strain. Like people are going to be like, why, what all of a sudden, like we're Egyptian thieves or something like that. And um, so if it has the idea of a relatively stable, flexible, simple core engine and the potential to tell a story, then I feel like it fits the parameters. There's nothing that I'm burning to work on right now. I mean, I'm working on a couple of different projects um, that have a legacy aspect of, that will be out over the next couple of years, and they're all fit that uh, criteria. But uh, there's nothing nothing that leaps to mind. As a, as a former journalist, I'd be, I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't ask, what might those be, Rob? Games. All right. Games. Yeah, Come I figured on. that's what I would probably get. Hey, no, I got you. Fair. <laughs> fair enough. Always like trying to get scoops when I can. All right. Uh, uh, Chris Chris K also was curious, though. Have you been hit with any weird or, or best or worst? He was curious for your best, worst, or weirdest legacy pitches that you've been you've been hit with. Um, I've gotten some that just aren't a match. Um, but I haven't gotten any weird ones. A lot of times it's a company saying like, oh, well, a lot of times it's people who don't realize how much work they are. And so it doesn't fit like the criteria. It's like, we already have this game that we're doing and it's really complex. And can we do a legacy version? Or sometimes when people are talking, they'll just say like, yeah, yeah, you know, you're going to pay it. And it'll be a legacy game. And then I'm like, whoa, no, wait, hold on. You just added a year and a half of work. And they're like, what? Like that it's, that is sort of like make a game and then making it legacy is like adding an exponent. I mean, I get requests and where I am, if it's not a match sometimes, or if I'm too busy, I, I just tell them that I'm happy to consult or give feedback on their project, but I just didn't don't have the time to dig in. Um, I suspect there's other people. And I think like uh, Netrunner just came up with a legacy esque experience. And it's interesting Then forbidden fruit takes some of the pieces of it and kind of ran with it. And so there's people having fun and doing stuff with it. And um, I don't think it was inspired by it, but time stories covers that sort of like a similar ground. So it's fun to kind of see this, slightly consumable but a more scripted experience like these types of games coming around right now and um you know they're fun to make and they're and they're fun to play so it's it's a little fad yeah and and uh how is that kind of witnessing 
the creation of that in a sense, some some idea that you thought was a crazy idea with Risk Legacy that who knows how how it's going to be received, and now it's it's all the hotness. I know, for instance, Mike Mike Fitzgerald is um, coming to the conclusion of of design on on his Legacy game. I know Charterstone, yeah. Jamie Stegmeyer is going to have some elements of Legacy in that. And uh, is that is that flattering to see? Is that is that rewarding to see? Oh, it's it's super flattering, and it's it's very surreal. I mean, a guy who's sitting there at Hasbro working on Trivial Pursuit and everything like that, be like, I don't know, I got something crazy, and then having it react like this, like I don't fully get it. Like you, it, it's maybe been about five times in the past year and a half since Pandemic Legacy hit number one that I've actually mentally processed that. Like even now talking about, it, I'm like, eh, that's not a true statement. There's no way I could have worked on something that's been received like that. Um, so it's, it's surreal. It's wonderful. But I, most of the time, um, you know, I'm just working on the next game and don't, don't really try to think too much about it. And I suspect like in 10 years or something, I'll sit back and go, Oh, and finally get a chance to sort of feel it in a way that I can't do now. Cause I'm just working on games and, you know, having fun that way. D Shannon Barry was, uh, put up a plea to do a, a medium weight Star Trek legacy game. That's that's his uh, that's his request. That is where I'm going to say, going back to our earlier part of the conversation, I was never a big Star Trek fan going growing up, or even as an adult. I've seen some of the movies, I've seen some of the shows. It is not a license that I know that well, and it would not be a license that, like you say that, and my immediate thought is, oh my goodness, there's so much stuff I would have to learn, and so many things I would get wrong. But there is a better designer for that project than me, because the people who love Star Trek would immediately think of ideas of how this would go and i'd be like i i don't know it doesn't have jedi it's the wrong star for me yeah. <laughs> yeah i'm more of a star wars guy than a star trek too so i i can i can identify with that so sorry d shannon barry i don't think that's going to be happening anytime yeah. soon uh, a couple questions on seafall uh, marco durbronic and i might have butchered that pronunciation sorry marco if i did he was curious were you satisfied with the reception that seafall got um well no, not really. I mean, it was it, it got a mixed bag, and um, and, it, and it's it's taken me about six months to kind of figure out like why it was a mixed bag, and and um, because I I kind of put my heart and soul into that one, but like as where pandemic what legacy I was talking about felt like easier than I expected. This was constantly harder than I expected. And one of the big things I came away with was it didn't have a simple base engine; it had a complex base engine. I was trying to basically prove to myself and or the world like I know I've been in Hasbro but I can make a complex game but it, it shouldn't have been a complex game and a legacy game and I think at the end what happened for a variety of reasons that are I'm not necessarily going to d- dredge up it got it needed one more round where Plaid Hat or myself stepped back and said hey I know we've been working on this forever I know we all want to get it to the finish line let's give it six more months of development right another round of play testing find all these little things and and we just didn't. And for ideas that absolutely seemed like the right call at the time, like we thought it was more polished than it was. We thought we knew the audience. And then I look at it now and I go, ah, I wish, you know, um, and I see reviews. Yeah, I missed that. Yeah, that could be, oh, I get questions from people. That rule was a little unclear. Ultimately, though, uh, I think, you know, there's many factors. Um, part of the issue is some of the early people doing it were comparing it a little unfairly and certainly unfavorably to pandemic, which was a very different experience for a different audience. I made Seafall for kind of role players. It's like a little like people who want to have an adventure in a way. And they weren't the people who were playing pandemic and expected Seafall to be pandemic legacy Two got a very rude awakening. And, you know, not everything I make is going to be like universally acclaimed. I think it's more the exception than the rule that people genuinely give something high ratings this one was just tough because it took like four years of my life so to have this come out and be like eh, it's pretty good or some people think it's not that great and some people think it's good was just it was not an easy couple months when that was coming out um but like everything else if you kind of can step back and figure it out and say okay well why did that happen and then how do you do better next time then it becomes a positive thing yeah, you mentioned that that unfavorable comparison. Do you think if if the releases had been flipped, if Seafall had come out before Pandemic Legacy, that the reception might have been totally different? It would have been different. I don't know if it would have been better. I think the underlying thing there was it, it was a very, very big game. I spent way too much and I couldn't see like what was working and what wasn't working. And if I could go back, 
in time and say to myself there, I would basically say like, Rob, like, you know, you think you're done and you know, you're keen to just get this out. You are going to be much happier if plaid hat gets a developer on there and just changes like 15 to 30% of it, because you can no longer see what's working and what's not. When it comes to really getting to the nitty gritty of legacy games and getting them ironed out and, and getting them in that place where, where they, where they feel like they're, they're good to go. What are, what are some secrets that you've learned along the way? Things that, that, are bigger that that take more time or are harder than than people might expect. Uh, what are the things that take more time? Well, just the simple act of when you go to make a play test kit and then people play it, you have to mostly throw that away. So, um, like regular the regular game, you can like start over. But I just finished play testing I don't know, last week or something a legacy thing I'm working on, and like you have to kind of throw away half the components and then print all new cards, even if you're not changing them, right? So the actual act of physically making a, a, a prototype uh, takes a long time, but towards the end of our last play testing run through of season two for pandemic, we were making handmade prototypes that were as close to looks like the final version as possible. Like this is the actual box size. This is an actual dossier because usability becomes a big concern. And so you don't want people to like open the wrong thing at the wrong time. So we were checking out that, but to make one of these with everything in it, with fake scratch off material and stickers and scored things and everything took about 10 hours. Oh, wow. right. Just, just to print it and cut it and score it and sticker it and get in. So you're making like two of those. Now my wife works with me full time and she's a super prototype designer and craftsy person and studio manager and does most of it now. But to be able to say like, okay, it's going to take three work days to make two of these. And then we're going to send them out and basically we're going to get one play test out of it. Uh, it it's just very uh, time consuming. But, you know, that's one thing we didn't do on season one is we didn't ever play test the final form factor. And there's some usability issues in season one that we we're unhappy with. And so this one, we right from the beginning tried to make it look like the real version as soon as possible because you're play testing. People get very con concerned in a legacy game in particular that they're doing the wrong thing or they get or they don't get concerned enough and so they like open the wrong thing or or read a card too quickly and then it, it's a compounding error like compounding interest if you misread a rule when you open it at the beginning of game four and you play that way incorrectly through five games it can start to cause major problems and um so you really have to watch things like when this rule is coming out, is there something else cool in the same box that the table is going to be distracted by so that they miss the rule, right? One person reads and goes, yeah, yeah, but look at this thing. And therefore, how do you separate those two things so that the rule can live on its own? Everyone goes, got it. And then in the very first game that that rule is introduced, make sure it's used a lot so that it gets integrated. And if they're not sure quite how it works, they can check it right there before they make a mistake and just run off and, and misuse it for five games. So these are like all these little user experience things that people probably don't think about. It sounds like, uh, and I have never designed a game myself, it sounds like a design nightmare in some ways. I kind of like it. I mean, it's obviously because I'm doing it. I like it because... Uh, it's different from most games and I, and I do a blend of legacy games and non-legacy and the non-legacy ones are almost like a little vacation in a way. Um, because you're not thinking about those, but I also like the legacy games are almost a vacation now because I've done like six or seven of them. So i I, my brain can work that way. It's a fun challenge to sit down and say, how do I make something interesting that is interesting and hopefully interesting across 12 to 15 times that you're technically playing the same game. And you want to show up for game 11, be as excited as possible. And what is the right number? Should it be eight? Should it be 10? Is six enough? Like, you know, like you talk about not getting people back together. There's some interesting, it's a new design space. So it's fun to still sort of try to figure it out. And, you know, like where you go off, like, oh, that wasn't right. Or that was a good idea. Or then, you know, it's, it's constantly being refined and that's fun. Got it. I want to move over to restoration games, which is uh, the big the big other side of things besides the legacy work and 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 iron wall games and and w what was the the impetus for for restoration games? Well, Justin Jacobson uh, was and is my my lawyer my you know for for gaming. He's been a gamer and he and he actually does a lot of law work and contract work within the gaming industry. And so I had known him my, my whole time being independent. And he wanted to kind of get out of law full time and he wanted to start a, 
a publishing company, like, you know, a publisher. And he came to me and said, I want to be a publisher. And I said, don't do that. There's enough of them. <laughs> and he went to Tom Vassell actually and said, I want to be a publisher. And Tom said, that's don't do it. And then for, to both of us, you know, not at the same time, but like, you know, he said, but here's what I want to do. I only want to take games that are out of print, touch them up and put them back in print. And everyone he said that to went, oh, no, actually, that's good. You should do that. So um, he uh, he kind of said to me, you know, you, this is what you used to do at Hasbro. You take a game of life and give it new breath. You, you, you take Clue and you could put a DVD to it. You could take Risk and you could make it work for two-player. So he said, I was kind of thinking of you with your background of taking an existing brand and sort of being able to break it down and then build it back up. This would be a good fit. And I was like, yeah, that sounds fun. And, and you know, I said, as long as it doesn't, do new games i'm fine because now i can have two halves it's not like i'm designing a game and then it's right of first refusal for restoration and it didn't muddy the waters there's this nice clean line between new work and restoration work and um so that was it It was off and running we sort of started talking in march of 2016 yeah that's about right announced it at gen con did a Kickstarter in February, and now we have three games coming out. Oh, you know, we'll be at Gen Con and going into full stock at that time. Stock Thief, Downforce, and Indulgence. It's a there's a card game, a racing game, and a deduction game, all based on various games from the seventies, eighties, and nineties. I think. So, Britt Mayer on the Guild was curious about what improvements do you do you make to these games when you're restoring them? Obviously, I would think you want to try and preserve a lot of the the core nature of what that game was. Uh, the idea is you're not creating a whole new game, but you do want to you do want to freshen things up a little bit. I'm sure update things. What are some of the improvements? And and he was specifically curious about uh, downforce. Yeah, uh, downforce probably changed the least. So you know we're still figuring this out. We're a new company, so we're figuring out our own guidelines. Um, but the idea is if we're just putting something back in market, if it's just a reprint, it's probably not for us. At least right now, what we want to be able to do is find a game that was great, and for some reason now. Um, needs something. Now, Downforce is a bit of the exception in the sense Wolfgang Kramer. It's a Wolfgang Kramer game and it has been out as um, Daytona 500 and Why Am I Draw uh, Top Race. Uh, and we changed very little. Like, this is the type of thing that we said, no, this is mostly a reprint, but what can we do? And we changed the auction system a little bit. And also, it was interesting because every time it came out and it's been reprinted, everyone tweaked the rules a little bit. So we kind of went back and said, well, we like this one and we like that one. We're kind of doing like a best of, or at least in our opinion, of the rules that had come out. We said, well, we'll give people a, a new a new racetrack. We'll change the bidding system a little bit. Um, it used to be that you ran three races and then you and then you combined your, your total winnings over three races. But each race takes like half an hour or 20 minutes. And we thought, eh, what if we just made this more of like a – a, a one race and done. I mean, there's still rules in there that you can play two races. You play them on the two different tracks and add your money. And we say, well, when you go from three races down to one race, some of the betting payout doesn't make sense because it's not, you know, you're not doing it over three races. So that that's why the auction doesn't work the way it was when you're only doing it for one game. So blah, blah, blah. These are the sorts of questions, but that, that is mostly a reprint. And most of the restoration came from, well, if we want this to be a half hour, just play one game. How does that affect uh, how does that affect things from there? And so that was an attempt of saying, given the lightweight nature of this game, like it's a game you can play with kids, getting the playtime to half an hour felt like it would be something that would be uh, more widely received by people in 2017. How tricky is it to get the rights to a lot of these older out-of-print games? Uh, well, in some cases, like Downforce, I mean, I met with Wolfgang Kramer at Essen and, you know, we had a meeting and we signed a contract. It was very simple. Uh, in the case of Stop Thief, we got in touch with the original inventor who was sort of delighted to license to us. But the last time it had been published, it was with Parker Brothers, now part of Hasbro, but it had been close to 40 years. So the contracts were missing. So Justin being a lawyer is what really has paid off here. So we had to talk to Hasbro. We had to dig around. We had to talk to the inventor. Right. We had to, you know, do, kind of talk to a lot of people. And, and then in the case of Indulgence, which was Dragon Master by Milton Bradley in 1982, 81, which was also published as Coup d'etat by Parker Brothers in the 60s or 70s, I think the 60s, but it was based on a public domain game and the inventor has passed away. That one was like technically because it was a public domain game, like there, no one really owned anything. 
right? But we had to make sure, is there an inventor? Did he own it? What's the licensing agreement? What's here? What was public domain? What was the original game like? What did he do here? What if we change it? So there, each game is kind of its own unique product of who owns what rights. And we always try to, we always do a tremendous amount of legwork uh, to find who we think is the person who is the rights holder because yeah, not only because it's no fun to get like a lawyer letter if you get it wrong, but we want to do right by the original person as much as possible. Right. We want with the last thing we want to do is have someone who's like 85 be like, they ripped me off. Right. Because we didn't do our homework. So we, we a lot of the criteria we do is well, who owns the rights? And where are they? And and some games we've talked about, you know, just we're probably not going to do because it, it just gets too complicated and, and it feels like we're going to get something wrong. Has there been a, a big one, uh, one that you really, really, really wanted to do, but for a lot of those rights reasons or, or things getting too complicated, just can't do? Uh, I think that the big, like, bright line of no that we have right now is there's a number of games that uh, Hasbro or any of their subsidiaries uh, published that were designed by an in-house publisher, like designer, like Epic Duels when I was there, um, that Hasbro just owns the rights to completely. And they're dealing with like multi-million dollar movie contracts. And even having worked there, it, it is proven to be next to impossible to license games from them because it's, you know, like, hey, we're going to make $5,000, 5,000 units of this card game. And they're going to be like, it's not worth our time to, to, to draft it. And just in general, they don't like to license stuff out. There have been exceptions over the years, but it's, it's, it's pretty contained. So the one thing that we're saying now is like, okay, if it was designed like, Thunder Road, for example, um, Omega Virus. There's a couple games that Hasbro did. It was designed in house, and we just have to say, okay, right now for the next couple of years until this changes, those are just off limits. Um, which one of these three are you most excited for? Which one do you think is going to get uh, get the best reception? If you had to guess, uh, I mean, Stop Thief it was the one that we kickstarted, and it's sort of the one that's our our flagship brand, so to speak. So I think it'll get the most attention. Um, you know, but I, I, I very carefully shaped the line with Justin. So I like all three of them. It's not like we did 35 games. And so therefore we had some that we didn't like as much as others. Dragon Master was my first trick taking card game when I was a kid. I worry a little bit that that's going to be a little bit too, you know, like niche for some people, but we, we figured out a way to make it $20 retail and there's like a lot of cool stuff in there. So I, we're hoping it's the type of thing that people go, ah, it's a $20 cool card game. And you've got these gems and you've actually got like a ring in there and you know, you've got these tarot size cards and a lot of people are like, well, I'll give that a try. Um, so in, in ones that we thought, you know, like indulgence didn't have the original name and stop thief does have the name and downforce doesn't. So we're still trying to figure out like what the messaging is to the general public of what they're going to resonate to. But just by the fact that, Stop Thief probably had the highest visibility coming in, and it's the original name. I think it's going to get the most attention just by default. Striker J was curious: Is Trop as as Chopper Strike, excuse me, being given the Restoration Games treatment? Is that a possibility, or is it just a Marty Connell fever dream? <laughs> uh, I think all a lot of things are a Marty Connell fever dream. <laughs> um, I, I have to say that off the top of my head. I, I don't think that Top Chopper Strike has been discussed in any real way during any of our meetings. Um, that doesn't mean it won't be on there. We're kind of looking for for hidden gems. So I can see right now that, you know, just on Board Game Geek, it's going it, to, there's an immediate red flag, which is it was by Milton Bradley uh -oh. and, the design, and the designer was uncredited, which means it might hit that, uh -oh. cannot, cannot make it because it was in house. But looking a little deeper, publisher, there are two different publishers. Uh, so if there was Milton Bradley and then an earlier one from a company that I've never heard of, which might mean it's an outside publisher. Um, and so therefore an outside inventor and therefore the rights not be, might not be solely owned by Hasbro. Look at this game, Marty, what are you thinking, man? Uh, <laughs> but this is one of those ones that like to sort of do it in real time. You look at it, it's cool. It's got a, a glass board with helicopters and a, a regular board with tanks or Jeeps underneath it. But like sort of immediate red flags I'm looking at is um, it's got like a grid board. It looks like a Stratego board, actually. Um, it just looks like the actual gameplay in 2018 or, you know, something would not live up to the fantasy of what it did before. But if we were like kind of pulling it apart and saying, what if we had a cool tactical war game where you had air and land together and how would that work? I mean, this might be one where we end up changing 
a, a larger amount and, and, you know, kind of inspired by the game. Uh, but, uh, we have not discussed it. Um, but cool to hear you kind of going through the process and have the wheels. Yeah, that's kind of the process. Bit. Yeah, that's the process. You look at it. And, um, so what we do at Restoration, we people can go to Restoration Games and just fill up. Please make this, and and you know every couple months the team there's like six of us now. Um, take a look at what should we look at, what's not, and and then yeah, you know, so we look at it. We'd go on Board Game Geek and we'd read some threads, and there's one here that says looking at a vintage battle game with a fresh pair of eyes. So I would immediately hone in there and see like okay. What did someone already else already do to say, I took this childhood game and I looked at it with a fresh set of eyes and what was their takeaway? Um, and, you know, we'd read the rules, might order one on eBay, might play it once or twice. And then, you know, a lot of them are like, eh, it, it's OK. And we might be able to make it better. And sometimes we're like, no, this this is really cool. We should make this. And, and that's where we go. But we're only in like the second year of figuring this out. All right. Here's my pitch. Ready? OK. Yeah, it's, it's not going to work because it's Milton Bradley. I'm already looking at it and remembering, but uh, Crossfire. Uh, so here's the thing. <laughs> no, okay. Well, I can tell you. We also have a rule of thumb. We don't make a game that's been published within the past 15 years. I mean, it's just a rule of thumb. Okay. Right. If, if it's been out like six years ago, we're like mm, people might have just heard it. Like it hasn't gone long enough away long enough to get a nostalgia factor. We will make exceptions. Um, Crossfire was still being made by Hasbro. Uh, when I was there, ah, it is also a tremendously large piece of plastic and a tremendously large box, which presents retail issues. And it's a bit more of a toy with an objective, with a win condition, yeah, with a win condition than it is a game. So we're not really equipped to move large to design large pieces of plastic in large boxes, and it might not fit like at a Gen Con crowd unless we did something significant to make the gameplay more robust. Crossfire Legacy. I'm just saying. Yeah, there we go. Everything's a legacy game. <laughs> just throw legacy on the end of anything. It works. Yeah. Upgrade your marbles. Happy right? Salmon Legacy. Let's do that. There we go. Whatever it is, just put it on there and it just sells itself. Perfect. Uh, Matthew Ward was curious, uh, any any future restoration games projects you can spill the beans on? So he's trying to do my journalistic work for me. So Any uh, restoration games? We will be doing an announcement at Gen Con for one or more of our next line and we're not really talking about anything new until then because we're trying to tell you please we have three games coming out <laughs> by these ones by, first yeah by these ones where it's like we're so excited to talk about in 2019 we might do this but right you know like really it's we got to sell those first three games to get the chance to do the next one so that's where we're focusing now so basically if you want there to be a future buy some restoration games and and go from there yeah All thank right. you Move, yeah, there we, that's that's the pitch. Yeah. All right. Going to move to some more general questions winding down. I, I appreciate you being so generous with your time, Rob. I really do. Uh, Peter Mulholland was curious, would you rather be attacked by a horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses? I think that uh, – I think one-on-one, -on -one, I think one horse-sized duck would be, would be a little more interesting. I don't know. They fly though. Right. So you couldn't even take high ground. Right. And, and horses are kind of deceptively big. If you're not near one and you get like, wow, that's, you know, seven feet at the shoulder or something or six feet. Um, but then you think about like a hundred duck sized horses. They, they just have like, how do you, even if you knock one or two of them out, if you kick them, right. Cause we're in a battle. So I allowed to be cruel to animals in them. In a For sure. Virtual, I mean, they're attacking you. This is self-defense. Uh, this is self-defense. Um, that's just a lot of hooves and a lot of teeth. Right. Coming at you. But maybe I think now that I think about it, um, if I can get like five feet up, a horse scaled down to that size, even with their jumping ability, shouldn't be able to get to five feet. If we're on the open plains, I'm dead either way. Sure. If I got any place where I can get on a rock or a fence or climb a tree, then I have to go with a, a, a herd of small uh, duck sized horses. I'm, I'm going with the small duck sized horses, if only because I, I feel like I could chip away. And in a war of attrition, I might do pretty well there. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. These are, these are the real questions. So oh, I, for sure. Oh, there's 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 my very last question coming up in a little okay. bit here um, is is the most important one. But we're not there yet. We're not quite there yet. BJ from Board Game Gumbo was curious. Do you still buy games, and what attracts you to a new game? I still buy new games, and I have a small house, and my wife and I both work full time for restoration and, and individual design. So that thing is is cluttered. So I'm constantly getting rid of games and buying new games. I partly buy games because it's my job, right? I hear about games. Oh, have you played this? Have you played that? Right. And they're coming out and I feel like I'm, I'm constantly behind and just keeping up with the cool new things, but I'm trying to, to do it. And I also buy games because I like playing games. 
Um, that's why I do this industry. So it's a balance, but it's weird because sometimes I have to say, okay, uh, Tuesday, I'm going to play games all day because I want to, and it'll be fun. And I almost have to like take a day off from work to play games. Like a lot of other people would, um, just cause I get so much going on. I, I, I have this pipe dream that I'm going to just, you know, start every day with my wife from eight to 10 in the morning, having coffee and playing a game before we start on our own games. But that's not how it works. And I've talked to a lot of designers. I remember I saw Antoine Bauza a couple of years at Gen Con and he was in a booth looking at a game. And I said, you're going to play it. And he's like, no, I said, do you have time to play other people's games anymore? And he just started laughing. And I'm like, yeah, me either. It's like when you get friends together and they're like, do you want to play a game? Almost always. I'm like, Hey, I got this prototype. (laughs) <laughs> right, and if you don't, if and then you like look at the prototype next day, and you go, ah, uh, why didn't I do? That? I had people here. You got to be that guy. Yeah, I, I do have to be that guy. Uh, but yeah, I still play games. I still like games. But a lot of times, at the end of the day, kind of the last thing I want to do is think about board games. Sometimes, so I watch a baseball game, or I just like go to dinner and have a glass of wine. Or if I play a game, it's going to be a, a you know, I'll watch my son play Destiny, or I'll play Skyrim or something because I'm a role playing game. You know role player on the, on the PlayStation four. So I'm still gaming and I'll play on my phone. It's not necessarily a board game sometimes as a way to relax. Cause I might've spent 12 hours working on board games. So BJ's other question is sort of ties into that because I recall seeing you and, and I bumped into you for the first time at BGG con and just, you were quickly running out of the room. I, I threw you a card and you're like, I talk to you soon. And, uh, and, and BJ was curious, are there any conventions you can go to just for fun? where you're not showing off a product, doing any sort of business. Is that even a possibility for you these days? I have it, I have that be the hope of every convention that I go to. <laughs> Some more than others. Gen Con is a, pure work vac- is a pure work convention. I actually say I'm going to a conference while there's a convention going on around me. Like that is meetings and press and booths and things like that. And it's fine. Like it's been that way for a while. And so I don't think of it as being something else. I'm surprised when other people are like, I played 10 new games at Gen Con. I'm like, what? Other ones like BGG Con, even though you're saying I was running by you to do something, I is a little bit more low key for me, and it, and I really oh, like good. it. I will play test a lot of games there, but I really like the idea of getting up in the morning and I just grab a table and I got some play tests. And if I'm, no one's around for a play test, I'll play a published game, and it's kind of like a nice thing going into the holidays. I, I really like it. And then there's a number of times where I deliberately don't schedule a lot, which means I only get half scheduled which means that I have time to kind of relax and enjoy myself. But like Eric Lang is the opposite. He's like, when we're both at this convention, let's have a four hour meeting on this game we're working at. And I'm like, I don't like, well, he's like, dude, we're face to face. I'm like, okay, you're right. So sometimes it's literally being at a convention, but then working on a game that I'm co-designing with someone because we're in the same place at the same time. Um, so sometimes it's like I'm near the convention, but not at the convention. And it's, it's just part of it. But, um, yeah, sometimes I try to get to a smaller convention. What I really would do is just have a weekend with friends. And I'm like, okay, everyone brings two games that they know the rules to. And there's going to be four of us. So there's going to be eight games. And we're just going to kind of play them all day. And that's just like a perfectly nice. That's when I get a lot of my casual gaming in. And then BJ was also curious what your favorite convention experience is. I kind of like running around. It means I'm busy and I'm getting work. Um, I, one of the things I really, I haven't done it at Gen Con in a while and I really should do it this year. So I'm glad you asked this question is I always find a role playing game that I haven't played before. And I've had a lot of fun just showing up, sitting down with five people I've never met, having a pre generated, you know, adventure from someone who knows the system well, that they've usually run at a bunch of convention convention. So it's tested and it's just this nice, like three or four hour break, like in a quiet corner of a ballroom. Um, that reminds me of how I got into games in the first place, which is, um, you know, role playing in the quiet corner or something. But I very quickly, even though I wasn't officially, you know, obviously a professional in games, I started role playing and then I went to the local convention at age 12 the first time. And at age 13, I was running the table and like being a GM, like I immediately went into a convention as a place to, to, you know, be on that side of the table. Um, early on. So it's nice to go way back to being like 12 years old in that sense. Jake Bach, in a non-board gaming question, was was curious about your cooking pictures on Twitter. And you yeah. seem to take a lot of joy in cooking. Is there a favorite dish that you have to prepare? Not necessarily to eat, but to actually prepare, to make. 
I tend to do a lot of Northern Italian. I tend to do a lot of Southern French and I tend to do a lot of new American, but I'm always fascinating at just finding different foods that I haven't made before and making them. Um, sometimes I like setting up a smoker and, and doing ribs for a long time. I've cured my own bacon. I have made like a eight course, eight, seven or eight course vegan meal. I've done things with intricate plating. I've done like meals for my friends, like 30 custom grilled cheeses all delivered at the same time. You know, like I just like doing new and different things and, um, cooking is my main way to sort of relax. And, and in some ways it feels a lot like game design where it hits a bunch of different senses and has, it has an underlying science to it, but you really make good stuff when you know the science and know what you can kind of ignore to do something interesting. In general, also anyone who asks me, do I have a favorite X or is going to get a long winded answer that doesn't answer the question? Cause my brain doesn't work that way. Justin claims he's the better cook in, in the bio for uh, restoration games. I don't know. Yeah, he's not. If you read my bio, it points out that one of us was a professional cook and it wasn't him. So <laughs> Fair enough. All right, my final question, also food-related. I ask this to every single person I have on here. Are you prepared for the final question, Rob? I think so. Okay, it's not that bad. Okay. Rob, if you could be any flavor of ice cream, which flavor of ice cream would you be and why? You know what my favorite ice cream was that I ever made? There, how's that for a different answer? No, I, wait, 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 wait. You're changing the question now? Come on. Well, no, I, therefore, I would like to be this ice cream flavor because I thought it was delicious. Okay. Was, was fresh corn ice cream. Oh. Corn is inherently sweet and it was August and I picked some corn up from a farm stand and I, uh, I brought it home and cut it off the cob and kind of uh, steeped it and boiled it in cream with some sugar. And and then use that to make an ice cream base. And I served corn ice cream with, oh, I forget. It was something you usually pair with corn. It was like a basil lime crumble or a cake or something like that. So I would like to be fresh corn ice cream. Now, now what does that say about you? What, is, what does fresh corn ice cream say about Rob Davio, the person? That I don't like a straightforward, normal answer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that I'm allergic to, like, you know, that I want to do something that's always like a little unexpected, even if some people think I'm crazy for doing so. That is the perfect way to end this, I think. Uh, Rob, if folks want to get in touch with you, follow your work, check stuff out, uh, what's the best way for them to do so? Uh, you can follow me. My I talk most about work on Twitter. It's at Rob Davio, so pretty straightforward. I have a website, robdavio.com. I'm very bad, like a lot of people, of keeping it updated, which reminds me I probably need to update it. But that's just more of a portfolio showcase for people who might want to do business with me. Uh, but Twitter is really the place to be. Very good. Thank you so much, Rob. I really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you.